Hello and you're welcome once again to another episode of History Now. I'm delighted this week to welcome as my guest Dr. Kira Meehan. Kira is a lecturer in history in the University of Hertfordshire and she's the author of a number of books on modern Irish history. Her current book, co-authored with a political journalist Stephen Collins, deals with the history of the Fine Gael party and is entitled Saving the State, Fine Gael from Collins to Veracker. Kira, you're very welcome to the show. Now, a number of weeks ago, you announced that this uh, book was going to be published, and like everything today, it's announced online on social media. Now, as soon as you announced that, it raised a lot of interest, negative and positive, it's fair to say. But, and I'm sure a lot of uh, authors would, you know, really welcome this level of publicity it was generated. Um, but, there's one thing that, well, there's a couple of things that people latched on to. And the first one was the title. And I suppose we should really address that first off. The title is Saving the State. I'm um, sure you were prepared for some um, pushback on this. Could you tell us the reason why you chose that title? Sure. Um, look, I wasn't surprised at all by the response that we got from some people about the title. Um, Saving the State is a very evocative title um, and was always going to prompt responses. Um, you know, and in part, book covers are designed to prompt response and to get people talking about it. And that certainly happened with this book. At no point did anybody point out the gender dynamic that was on the cover. And that's possibly understandable because it is a book about the party's leaders and there hasn't been a woman leader. But for me, as, as a woman, as a historian as well of gender, um, the cover, and I'm going to shamelessly hold it up here, serves as a very stark reminder of gender imbalance, not just within Fine Gael, but within Irish politics as well. If you look across it, it is man after man after man who has led the party. Now obviously the Social Democrats um, today are doing much to shore up gender balance. We have Mary Lou Macdonald, we've had uh, Mary Harney as leader of the Progressive Democrats in the past, but the noticeable um, underrepresentation of Irish women in Irish politics um, is something I think that is um, something that needs to be addressed, first of all, and the culture uh, within which Irish politics operates is, is you know, a big issue there. But for me, um, when we were putting this book together and when we were getting the cover back from the designer and seeing the, the various images being um, laid onto the cover, I found it quite depressing. Um, I found it a really stark reminder of um, the fact that we have so far to go in terms of gender representation and gender balance in the parliament. Um, and I'm sort of surprised in a way that nobody has pointed that out about the cover. I think a lot of people have interpreted Saving the State as an editorial comment. And um, you could argue that it would have been more appropriate perhaps to have um, quotation marks around it. But of course, when design features are taken into consideration, that isn't always possible. Um, Saving the State is not an editorial comment on the part of either myself or Stephen. Um, where we actually came up with the title um, is because the book is not just about the history History of Fine Gael, but it's also an exploration of how the party, its leaders and its membership perceive the party and its history as well. And um, throughout its existence, from the moment its forefathers in Cumann Gael through to the most recent general election with Leif Radker being interviewed in RTE News, the party has presented itself as the defenders of the state, of the democratic institutions, of saving the state at times when those democratic institutions appear to be uh, a threat. Um, and so when we were trying to come up with a title, this seemed to us like an appropriate way of encapsulating how Fine Gael has viewed itself. Um, and then if we move to the subtitle, you know, we've called it From Collins to Varadkar, which has also created lots of um, commentary and lots of helpful people on Twitter pointing out that Collins was dead before Fine Gael was ever um, created, um, which you would hope that us as authors would have known that. <laughs> um, but again, you know, people are entitled to their views. 
Why we went for Collins to Faradka is for similar reasons as to why we chose Saving the State. It is about the party's perceptions. Um, Collins is seen as a father figure of Fine Gael. Now we do in the introduction and at various points in the book point out that he was dead before even Cumann a Gael was created, uh, never mind Fine Gael. Um, but party members uncritically um, accept or believe that had Colin survived, he would have been a member of Fine Gael, he would have been a party leader. You know, it's one of the great what ifs of Irish history um, and going down the route of, of counterfactual history from my perspective of a his, as a historian isn't particularly helpful in this scenario. Um, but yeah, to, to sum up what I've just said, Saving the State and From Collins to Faradkar is a reflection of Fine Gael's uh, own perception of its history rather than us trying to recreate history or impose a lineage. So if we could sort of delve in a bit more into Collins and where he features in Fine Gael lore, because I know this is something you have tackled uh, previously in, in 2008. You wrote a really uh, interesting art, journal article on that um, sort of lineage from Fine Gael to Fine Gael and included Collins. So if we could talk a bit more about that, please. Yeah, he, I mean, Fine Gael have their pantheon of heroes anyway, but um, Collins um, assumes a very distinguished place within that. You know, as I mentioned, they see him as something of a father figure of the party, which is unfortunate because, uh, to Arthur Griffith, I mean, because, you know, Arthur Griffith is active at the same time as Collins. He chairs the delegation uh, that goes and signs the treaty. Um, but Arthur Griffith, in comparison to Michael Collins, is not the, the sexy figure of Irish history. He doesn't have that charisma. Collins as well because he dies young and the circumstances in which he died um, made him uh, automatically you know this heroic tragic young figure um, who has who has been lost um, from the future of this new state. Um, and Dolan the historian has made the point that from the Fine Gael perspective he died before he did enough to damn himself as well um, so you never really see him tested as a leader of the new state once it comes into existence and so he is the perfect rallying figure um, for members of the party to go back to. He is charismatic, he is fighting for the state, he is seen as being at the forefront of the creation of the new Irish Free State um, and unlike Ono Duffy for example, uh, he isn't yet problematic. Um, so you see it at various points throughout the party's history in the 40s and the 50s uh, he is used as a rallying figure when really the party doesn't have much else to be optimistic about. Um, he sort of drops out a bit in the, in the 70s and 80s and I would argue that's because Gar Fitzgerald uh, is giving the party something else to focus on uh, and is kind of um, restructuring the party's identity. But then you know when we move further on again in the party's history um, especially during the, the financial crisis when Enda Kenny is leader um, and the institutions of the state seem to be under attack in a different way. Uh, it's very easy uh, and uh, appropriate from the Fine Gael perspective that Enda Kenny would have invoked the memory of Michael Collins, casting himself in the same role in the way that Michael Collins was defending the creation of the state. Now Enda Kenny was defending and protecting uh, the, the state from financial collapse, from financial ruin. And so a nice, uh you know, inroad here, segue to something around name recognition, and that is Owen O'Duffy, the first president of Fine Gael. Now, you mentioned in the book that any mention of O'Duffy, a really controversial figure, is studiously avoided by party members. So given that his importance is there and that he's in many ways officially airbrushed from the party history, can we talk about the chapter which you devote to Owen O'Duffy and the blue shirts and why you felt it was necessary that this was approached in the way it was. Yeah, well, Ona Duffy is the first president of Fine Gael. Uh, no matter how much the party tries to point out he was never a leader in the Dáil, um, that doesn't matter. The fact is that he was the first president of the party. Um, 
And Owen Duffy, of course, is a controversial figure. He is most typically presented in his blue shirt uniform, which is the picture that, it, you know, is on the spine of our book, as you mentioned. Um, and because of that blue shirt uniform and the way that he presented himself, there are immediate parallels drawn with the continental fascist movement. But because there are definitely elements of, um, of fascism within the blue shirts and particularly within Owen Duffy, that doesn't sit comfortably for Fine Gael members. It doesn't sit comfortably with their self-perception as the party uh, that is the defender of the state, again, to go back to the title of the book. And it has been easier for them just not to talk about O'Duffy than to tackle the nuances um, of the issue. It's another reason why they do go back to Michael Collins, because as I said, he is less controversial compared to O'Duffy. Um, but I think uh, O'Duffy and the blue shirts, it is more nuanced than um, the accusations of being a blue shirt fascist allow for. Um, one of the really interesting things is if you break down what the blue shirts were advocating and how they were presenting themselves, um, one of the most notable things is that at no point did they officially and of course, there were some minorities who would have been in favour of this, but officially, they weren't advocating for the disestablishment of Dáil Éireann. Now that's the overthrow of democratic rule is one of the hallmarks of a fascist movement. Um, and of course, once O'Duffy seemed to be um, heading down that route, it was elements of Fine Gael themselves who removed him out of the party's presidency and, and away from the party. So I can understand absolutely why Fine Gael and its members uh, aren't keen to remember O'Duffy. But in doing so, they're, all, they're almost subconsciously adding to the perception that they were a full-blown fascist movement, when in fact, you know, as, as historians have pointed out, it is, it is much more nuanced than that. Another important theme which your book covers, Kira, is that of political continuity. And throughout the book, there are examples of how Fine Gael members can trace their own personal family lineages back to come to Gale and in some instances to the old Irish Parliamentary Party. And I think that's a very important theme in the book. But there's also, as I say, family, a family tradition, not only in Fine Gael, but also Fianna Fáil and other parties. And that's probably most recognisable in this book with W.T. Cosgrave, who was the leader of Cumley Gael, then in Fine Gael, and his son became Taoiseach as leader of Fine Gael in later decades, uh, or in the 1970s. Now, Liam Cosgrave is another very interesting figure that perhaps isn't sort of immediately recognisable, but he, he was leader of the, the party in a very important period. Uh, important from my perspective in that he was leader just as the height, at the height of the Troubles in the 1970s. And your book, very interestingly, argues that the first Loyalist bombs in Dublin, in, in fact, saved uh, Liam Cosgrave's political career. So could we talk about Liam Cosgrave in relation to what was going on in the North and the violence that was spilling over into the South? So Liam Cosgrave is a fortunate leader in the sense that, as you say, the Lilas bombs saved his career. When he becomes party leader, um, it is at a time when Fine Gael are, is starting to reevaluate who it is or what it is um, because of Declan Costello and the Just Society. And Costello really challenged Fine Gael to think about itself as something other than not Fianna Fáil, right? And uh, it is you know, he's not the most progressive liberal person, but he is certainly moving the party more in a liberal direction. Cosgrave himself is quite a hands-off leader. Um, you know, he went home for lunch. He wasn't generally uh, contactable by his cabinet, or sorry, by his, his front bench colleagues um, when he is at home and so on. And um, some of his colleagues would have said that he wasn't always the greatest communicator. So you have this tension within the party Party, you have a relatively hands-off leader and it starts to kind of bubble up. Um, but then the Lilas bombs happen and Liam Cosgrave, who at times could be a really great orator, and you see that in the powerful deliveries he often gives at Ardesh, uh, Ardeshna, he comes into his own and here he draws on this long-term Fine Gael history. Um, he talks about, um, you know, Fine Gael as the defenders of the state. He is able to rally his party behind them. Um, 
So when Fianna Fáil are introducing or are trying to introduce legislation that some would argue, um, you know, is an infringement of civil liberties and, and members of Fine Gael themselves are convinced by that argument. Instead, Liam Cosgrave is able to say, we must support this legislation, um, you know, if you look at the history of our party, we have a track record of defending the state. The state is now uh, in crisis again. It is our moral duty effectively. Um, and invoking that long-term history of Fine Gael, going back to his father, to W.T. Cosgrave, he's able to bring the party with him. But that could only have happened because of the bomb and because of the environment that it created, um, allowing, as I said, Cosgrave uh, to invoke the party's legacy had it not happened again another great what if but it certainly seems that um, elements of the party would have been ready perhaps to to move against him and the, t the topic of uh, Northern Ireland the increase in violence and then going on in the moves to um, find a political way out of this and that's very much a feature of the, the next person I wish to speak about and that's Gareth Fitzgerald of course Gareth Fitzgerald was very famous uh, for the Anglo-Irish Agreement, but that didn't define his uh, career as leader of Fine Gael. Uh, in the book, you show that also as part of his um, time at the helm was increased uh, European integration. So could we talk about Gareth Fitzgerald and his importance with that, all those different fronts that he was um, active on? And, you know, for want of a better term, how he brought the party into a modern era? Yeah, Fitzgerald is um, a figure who is held with great admiration within Fine Gael for a variety of reasons. And I think, uh, you know, to, to a great extent, perhaps rightly so, for what he did for the party and also for some of his contributions more broadly. He was certainly the first of the more outward looking Fine Gael leaders. And by outward, I mean, also within the island, you know, looking more closely to the north and then, as you say, uh, to Europe and to European integration as well. Um, prior to becoming uh, Taoiseach, uh, when he was in his, his finance role previously, you know, he would annoy cabinet colleagues by regularly wandering into the, the foreign affairs portfolio. Um, and, and speaking about the North and other issues too. And of course, Fitzgerald himself was very keen to explain his interest in the North um, by his own family history. Um, his mother Mabel, of course, being um, of Northern extraction um, and also uh, the uh, different religious views that were contained within his, his uh, family as well. Um, so because of his mother and because of the time he spent with his cousins as well, um, he claimed that he had a better understanding perhaps of the situation in Northern Ireland compared to some of his counterparts. And that seems to have influenced his desire um, to be more involved or to pay greater attention of course, politicians at that time really couldn't have ignored Northern Ireland because of everything that was going on. Um, and so um, he he's kind of pulled along or brought along, I suppose, by circumstances too. Um, but I think it would be unfair to suggest that Fitzgerald involves himself in Northern Irish issues just because of what was happening at the time. He clearly has had this much longer interest in it. Going back to his early writings when he publishes his personal manifesto effectively in studies and then when he produces a New Ireland and obviously his constitutional crusade as well. But because of his attitude towards the North and because of his um, em embrace of, of European politics as well, he is definitely more out looking Fine Gael leader and to go back to your point about modernizing the party as well there is a real root and branch overhaul that happens he zigzags his way across the country with remarkable energy it seems speaking to constituencies almost foreshadowing what um, Enda Kenny would do in the aftermath of the the devastating 2002 election for the party um, and with Peter Prendergast's influence, uh, there is much greater influence or much greater uh, attention paid to constituency organisation, which was not really ever 
too much of a priority for Fine Gael. So definitely the Fitzgerald era, I think, marks, as you say, a, a more modernised Fine Gael. I suppose for someone who is of roughly my age and, you know, with my earliest political memory, some of them being around the Anglo-Irish Agreement and Gareth Fitzgerald, but what tends to happen in that is Gareth Fitzgerald is always cast as the polar opposite of the other uh, political leader at the time in the South, Charles Hockey. Uh, in, my, in that sort of period, they're always seen as a pair. Obviously, with your book, is focusing on the Fine Gael party and Gareth Fitzgerald, it sort of divorces that arrangement somewhat. Was that easy to do, to take him out of that sort of um, Charles Hockey's orbit, so to speak? I think influenced by a few things. Uh, space was one of them, I have to be honest. We had to do a huge amount of editing even to get it down to the sizable volume if it came in the end. Um, secondly, as you say, it is a book about Fine Gael, And while we do, ex you know, ex Band on the wider context we're ultimately focusing in on the party but also I think there is an element that um, talking about Fitzgerald in the context of Hawhey ha and the dichotomy you know between Garrett the good and, and, and the creations of Hawhey means that Fitzgerald as an individual um, there isn't as much scope to to examine him um, you know, that he's either haughty or he's not haughty and, and, and he's presented as not being haughty, generally speaking. Um, so what we tried to do was to liberate him uh, to an extent from that um, pairing and, and to see him as a leader in his own right, to look at his motivations, um, his influences and, and where he stood in the political system in, in general, if that makes sense. Although Fine Gael are in some ways... A conservative party and I think that's undeniable there are many conservative elements within that but at the same time they have these very uh, socially liberal policies and I'm thinking about different referendums um, coming up to the present day you've got the divorce referendum in 1995 uh, the marriage equality referendum uh, a number of years ago and the most recent repeal the eighth um, referendum now for a party a major party in the Irish state especially if the further you go back it seems that a lot of these things are breaking with Catholic Church teaching and we know that the Catholic Church was an enormously powerful force in the Irish state for many, many years. How important was this perceived break from what was Catholic social teaching at the time uh, for a party like Fine Gael? It does represent a big shift, but I think we have to be careful as well not to overemphasise the early parts of it at least, because when Garrett Fitzgerald talks about divorce and includes it as part of his constitutional crusade. Yes, it's a progressive step forward in terms of giving people greater control over their, their marriage and marital breakdown, but it is also framed in somewhat conservative thinking because Fitzgerald's argument is that divorce, you know, sorry, marital breakdown happens. And by introducing divorce, it then allows couples to remarry. And so his arguments in favor of divorce is actually in the context of strengthening the institution of marriage. Um, in other words, um, allowing people instead of just cohabitate, cohabiting to actually then go on and get married again, right? So it's still the very traditional understanding of, of what marriage is. Um, of course, the church would not have in, interpreted it in that, in that way, but I do think it is important to, to say that Fitzgerald is, is coming from a conservative point of view with that. Um, but nonetheless, it does mark um, Fine Gael elements of it moving in a more liberal, progressive uh, direction. That's not to say that there are tensions within the party. Of course there are, and there are still many conservative views held within the party to the present day as well. Um, and then you move on and, and you know, as you mentioned, you, we have the marriage referendum and then we have the repeal the eighth and, and what happened there as well. Um, and again, of course, the party is at the forefront of that from the political perspective because it's in government and it's facilitating it. Um, but again, I would point out that the uh, grassroots grassroots campaigns here cannot um, be ignored. The influence of civil society, the repeal of the eighth groups, the campaign for yes, uh, when the March referendum was, uh, was in the lead up to the vote were hugely important. And 
I think what Fine Gael did was to read that society was changing um, and that uh, these were the demands of the overwhelming majority of people um, within the Republic who wanted these changes and they moved with that. And that's not a criticism of the party. I think, you know, a political party should be taking the temperature of the people who voted into power or, or into the doll at the very least. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily overstate the liberal side of it. And just to qualify that a little bit further, because I don't want to cause offence to people in the party who, who are liberal in their outlook. Um, but I think that often the party is prompted to introduce these changes because of lobbying from people outside if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, there is definitely progressive elements in the party, no doubt about it. There are still conservative elements in the party. That's, it, um, a, you know, a fact as well. Um, but the, the outside influences of, of civil society has also been extremely important in taking Fine Gael to where it is today. And leading up to the present time, Kira, uh, your last chapter of your book deals with the coalition that now has emerged of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, two parties who can trace their roots back to the treaty split of 1922, 21 22. So uh, your, your chapter is called At the End of Civil War Politics? Question mark. Without going into the ins and outs of things, I just want to ask you, do you think that this is the end of civil war politics? Yeah, the question mark was a very deliberate inclusion there. Um, Look, it, I think it's hard to say, you know, we are historians, we're not predictors mm -hmm. of the future. But if you look at how the coalition has acted so far, the cohesion within it isn't particularly convincing. Um, at times, the parties, the two parties seem to be acting independently or not consulting each other or making statements without having spoken to one another. Um, there are obviously, you know, the early teething issues of being in power together for the first time and feeling their way through how that's going to work. Um, is it going to lead to a merger of the two parties, as some people are, you know, suggest? Uh, I don't think so. Will Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael continue in their current entities? Probably not. You'll see, I think, them um, evolving in different ways to establish themselves. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's going to be, the next election is going to be a challenge because if Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael aren't going to go back into coalition together, then they're faced with the difficulty of how do we distinguish between the two parties? Um, because for years now, commentators, political observers, the, the general person on the street has been saying there is no difference between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Now they're in government together. Um, the challenge will be for them in the future in terms of how they, they re-establish their, their separate identities. Um, will they continue to govern together? Who knows? Political expediency is a great thing for focusing the minds. And obviously the challenge that was mounted by Sinn Féin and the surprising result of the election, which, you know, caught many people, including, I think, Sinn Féin by surprise themselves. Um, well, that may that may continue to focus the mind. Um, but I think that the coalition was born out of political need as opposed to any real desire to to put the differences yeah. behind themselves. And Kira, your book, it's, it's a really engaging book and I, I really thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I was fortunate enough to be uh, given an advanced copy to review. It's, um, it's an ambitious book, a very ambitious book uh, and pulls together a lot of themes, which uh, it's very, it's a very readable a uh, very accessible book so congratulations on the publication can you tell our viewers where they'll be able to find it uh, so it's available from all good bookstores as people say though of course with current restrictions um, actually visiting the bookstore is an issue so um eason's uh Dubre, um most of the big suppliers, uh, Waterstones, uh, all have it. And uh, if you're looking to for kind of more international suppliers, then obviously Amazon um, are also stocking it too. Kira Mian, thanks very much for joining me today. I was really delighted to have you on. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thank you for having okay. me.